and welcome back to Meeting of the Minds. Today, I'm here with a very special guest, Zachary King. Zach, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So now I heard your story back in 2015, massive conversion. Uh, originally, if I have this right, uh, you, were, you were formerly a Satanist and one of the, I think, nine grand wizards in the world. I didn't even realize that existed and what that was about. But hearing your, your tremendous conversion to the faith, I just thought it would be great if we could get um, some of your expertise on magic and the occult and as well as your conversion. Sure. And if you might, uh, let me interject here. It was a high wizard. Go ahead. It's a high wizard. A grand wizard, I think, is a member of the clan. Oh, okay. A high wizard. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, um, tell us, tell us about that. How did, well, I guess some of the, I guess we'll jump right into it to keep, keep it interesting. So what have you seen in re regard to the occult, the occult and magic with Halloween? So is that a big day for Satanists, um, jack-o'-lanterns? Like, how is that related? I went to a, um, uh, an Illuminati book. It, it was like a library yeah. and they have two in the world. And so I went to one that's near Boston and there's many sections and you have somebody that escorts you through the library. They don't let you just walk in and, you know, be yourself. And um, so I didn't know what to expect. I was just walking through and there's a section called Satan in his own words. So apparently <laughs> Satan himself wrote these books or possessed somebody personally and then wrote these books. And so I was going through one of those and it had a story in it, the tale of Halloween. Okay. And according to the tale of Halloween, it was started by Satan. And that there was people, there were Druids that would comb the countryside, either looking for um, a sacrifice or a donation. It'll be a large donation, like whatever you're, if you're a, a farmer or a herder of some kind, then you have to donate the best of your herd or the best of your, your crops, or you have to donate a large sum of money. Or if you can't do any of that, then you have to donate like your virgin daughter. And that's, that's for a sacrifice later. And then all these people would meet at Stonehenge and there's altars outside of where the, the regular stones are standing up and you have these altars all around that. And then in the middle of the large stones is this giant bonfire. And so they sacrifice either animals or uh, offer, I don't know if they offer the, the, all the food to the gods, so to speak. And then they, um, or they sacrifice the virgins. And then in this bonfire, the leader of the Druids calls forth um, Satan to show up. And if mm -hmm. Satan shows up and he's pleased with the sacrifice, then he grants them whatever they're wishing for, which is usually like um, more money or property or you know, some, some, some shallow something, I'm sure. Right. right. And then if he's not happy with the sacrifice, he kills the leader. Somebody else bumps up into that place and it starts over again next year. And they would go to these different uh, farms or towns looking for one of these things and they would say something close to trick or treat which is where we get, you know, the original trick or treat from. And then mm -hmm. if you gave them whatever they were looking for, then they would leave you with a jack-o'-lantern on your doorstep. And if you didn't give them what they were looking for, then they left a mark with blood on your door so that a demon would come in during the night and possess somebody from that house and cause either them or somebody else in the house to die. Wow, it's, it's, it's real, it almost sounds unbelievable. 
that's in i have a, a cd called tale of halloween and that's the story that i have you know I, the, the reason i have for believing it and disbelieving it is the same the devil says it yeah you know he can be 99 percent truth and one percent lie you know and it's that one percent that ruins the whole thing i don't know if the story is true or not you know but i do tell you where i got it from yeah and it sounds like you have seen similar things in different areas i remember listening to your story and talking about magic spells and this was something you used to be involved with you said they they are real in a lot of the um maybe shows or movies that we've seen or games um can you comment on that whether it be dungeons and dragons harry potter common things that we see sure i mean well my experience with harry potter you know, and this is some of this is from other people's experience. Uh, my friend, Father Chris, used to be an exorcist. He might still be an exorcist, but I haven't seen him in two or three years. And he told a story about the first year he got involved in exorcisms. He had 11 exorcisms the entire year. And then the following year, he had 11 cases during the summer. And that the common thread between all 11 cases, and these were people that were all different ages, some were children up to the elderly, and you know they were from not having a job, being a child in school, to there was a homeless guy living in an alley in a box, and then one guy, he did an exorcism or was living in a mansion. And, but all these people had the, complete collection of Harry Potter books. Wow. And he didn't even know what Harry Potter was. And then um, one of the other priests that I've heard gave a story was uh, Father Chad Ripperger right. did an exorcism a few years ago. And when the demon manifested itself, he asked it to identify itself and it identified itself as one of the six. And he didn't know what one of the six meant. So he had to do further clarification. You know, what, is, what does that mean? And he said that J.K. Rowling, through automatic writing, asked to be possessed so that she could write a hit series. And so she got possessed by six demons, and they wrote the Harry Potter series. Wow. Wow. And, and you've seen this, you've done magic before in the past and were any of the, and those spells you said from a lot of those shows or whatever were real. Right. Oh, well, all of the Harry Potter spells are real. She admitted in an interview that one third of her research went into occult books because she wanted authentic spells to be in the books and, and in the movies to make it more authentic. Wow. Also, there's a, there's a witchcraft website that I found a few years ago that it, they, they're charging for spells. So, I mean, if you want a, a medium love spell, it'd be like $99. If you wanted um, a better love spell than that, you're going to pay about $300, and a top love spell would be $500. And they had a spell for anything you would want was on there. And there were different tiers for how much it would cost you. And then there was a section for free spells. And I looked in the free spells and they were all Harry Potter spells. Wow. And they told you on the website that these spells are real. They really work. You know, but because anybody can find them, you know, if you buy the books or see the movies, that they weren't going to charge you for them either. Wow. And now is there anything, how about related to like car, other cartoons like Disney or Bugs Bunny, anything like that? I know it might sound crazy, but because you do see different people saying different things where the characters saying it, is, is there anything to that or are those just more nonsense words? Um, almost everything in Disney deals, almost every episode of every show deals with magic. You know, I mean, these, these things are designed to desensitize us to, to the real evil that's out there. You know, they make everything look fun. And there's no repercussions or 
you know, no, 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 there's no sin in Disney. Right. Right. Now, I also think my mind jumps back to now the holidays. Are there any other American holidays or, or normal holidays that, that are celebrated that have ties to the occult or maybe occult practices are going on at that time? Bigger days for Satanists and witches and Druids or anything like that? Well, for, um, for Halloween itself, before Halloween happens in September, there's kidnappings that happen all over the world, even here in the United States. And then these people are fed a special mixture and then they're sacrificed on Halloween. Wow. You know, and it's not just human sacrifice. There's cats and dogs that get sacrificed as well. There's even, um, there's some reports in some bigger cities that around Halloween, lots of cats are found skinned. And some of them look like they've been skinned alive wow. and sacrificed. Wow. You know, and that's, you know, anybody can Google search that stuff. It's in the news that this is common stuff. Yeah. You know, and just because you've never heard of it doesn't make it any less true. Right. And now is this some of the things you've seen firsthand? Yeah. Well, I haven't seen a, a cat skinned alive, but I've seen the aftermath, you know, the, the results of a pile of cats in a dumpster. Wow. And how about um, other, what, what seems like innocent childhood games like Pokemon or Bloody Mary or Candyman or anything like that? Candyman, I'm not real sure how... You know, I mean, I saw the movie when I was younger, yeah. but, you know, that seems like it was copied after Bloody Mary. Yeah. Um, Bloody Mary, who was how I got started in practicing magic, was, you know, in the first, the first day of the fifth grade, a kid came up to me and said, hey, meet me in the bathroom at the first break. And the first break was at 1020. And you know, you get out of class and you've got like 15 minutes to walk around and do whatever you're going to do. So I met him in the bathroom, not knowing why. And I walked in the room and there was like 50 kids in there. It's like boys and girls. And at that time, you know, prior to this school, all the light switches were an actual switch that you flipped up or down. Right. And in, in these places, you had to have a special key to stick it in the wall and move the key and that would turn on the lights. So the kids figured out if you bent a paper clip and stuck it in there, that would work. And so we we're gonna turn out the lights and chant the Bloody Mary phrase into the mirror. And they said, if we do it right, the spirit of a burn victim would show up in the mirror. Well, what the heck, let's try that, let's see what happens. And so they turned out the lights and 50 of us chanted this phrase and then suddenly this face appeared. Now, no one's in there with a flashlight. You know, now you can get a holographic flashlight at Spencer's. Well, you couldn't get that then. And, you know, I mean, this is 1976. Yeah. You know, we are mesmerized by what we're seeing in the mirror. But 49 of those kids ran screaming out of the bathroom. And I tell people in my talks, one child, one idiot, and call him an idiot because it was me, decided that's the coolest thing ever. I chanted this phrase like 11 times and suddenly this face appeared, you know? And we had so many people did it and so many people ran in a panic to get out of the bathroom that we had students get hurt, like broken arm, broken leg hurt. You know, they got trampled by the other 49 people. So they sent notes home and said that if we were caught playing this at school, we'd be suspended for three days. So I had to take that note to my dad. You know, I took, my took this note up to my dad in the den, you know, and I was like, hey, yeah, they gave us this note at school. And he's like, what's it say? I said, I don't know, I didn't read it. And um, so he reads the note and he calls me up to him and he's like, have you been doing this? It's like, no. I said, they sent the note home with everybody. Everybody had to take this to their parents. 
right? Nice. So, you know, but I never told him that I was doing it. And, you know, so he's like, you'd better not be doing this. So he let me read it. And I was like, well, I don't want to be suspended for three days. So, so I wouldn't get caught at school. I started doing it at home. So I had my own bathroom in my room. And, you know, at school, we did it once a day. But now at home, I do it, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I'm doing it. Before I go to the bathroom, I do it. After I go to the bathroom, before I brush my teeth, after I brush my teeth, before I leave for school. Then when I get home, my parents aren't home. When I get home, I'm doing it in the bathroom like 20 times a night. You know, if I get up during the night to go to the bathroom, I'm going to do it again. You know, it's like every time I did it, I had the face appear. So, you know, I mean, you can only do that so many times before you start to wonder, is this magic? Is this what I'm really doing? You know, and at the same time as that, I was playing Dungeons and Dragons. You know, remember this game came out in 1974. This was 1976. And among all the high school students, who was the rage. I was in middle school and I had a lot of friends that were in high school through my church. So we played D and D campaigns every weekend. And in that, I'm always the sorcerer, the, the wizard. And after a while, after doing magic in that, and in that, you know, I mean, you, you do a magic spell and then you roll a die to see if, 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 if you score high enough in the roll, the magic trick comes true. Well, I mean, that's not a real magic spell, but they gave you real magic spells in the gaming books. Now, if you buy those gaming books, there's no real magic in them but the original books did have real magic. And there's a story that says that the two founders of D&D, &D, it was Gary Gygax and uh, another guy with a less cool name than Gygax. No one remembers unless I can't remember the second guy. But um, they went to witches and Satanists to get real spells to put in their books so that the game would be authentic. You know, even though it's a fantasy game. And um, so, you know, doing magics every weekend and that, and doing the Bloody Mary chant every day, you know, I just started wondering, is magic a real thing? You know, if we'd have had Harry Potter back then, that would have been it for me. I would have been totally convinced just with that movie and the books. But, you know, as it was, I had the experience of the other two things. And I did a magic spell for real in real life thinking, you know, if this works, then I'll know magic is real. I'll know it's an authentic thing. Because I had asked my parents and my Baptist preacher if magic was real, and they all said no. You know, like, I don't know how all of them missed the 33 different verses that tell you not to do magical things in the Bible. You know, but they, you know somehow they all missed that. You know, why would God warn you against something if it wasn't real, if you couldn't do it? And it's like, if thou shalt not lie, if lying was impossible, thou shalt not lie wouldn't be in the Ten Commandments. Right. So, you know, I did a magic spell for money. And the next day I went out and I found a can of tennis balls with $5 in it. But I thought, all right, that could have been a coincidence. Somebody had to find that. So the following weekend, I did another magic spell for money. I went out and I found a $10 bill on the side of the road. And I thought that still could have been a coincidence. So the following Friday, I did the spell in my bathroom. And halfway into the spell, I did the Bloody Mary chant. And when the demonic face showed up, which I still wasn't sure it was a demon, you know, I still thought it was a spirit of a burn victim. But when that showed up, I made sure it knew I was doing a spell for money. And the next day, I went out and I found. Uh, what looked like Monopoly money rolled up tight in rubber bands. And when I got home later that night, you know, unraveled them all and found out that I was worth a thousand dollars. It looked like Monopoly money because I'd never seen a hundred dollar bill. Right. But, you know, I never would have done those things. I never would have done those three spells if I hadn't been playing D and D every weekend and doing this bloody Mary thing all the time. Right. And you hear things about celebrities selling their soul to the devil or making a deal with the devil. And how true is that? 
And are they capable of doing that? And will the devil or demons give them power then? Well, what people do, when, when I was a high wizard, we would do what was called a warehouse deal. And it's where everybody that wants to be a rock star goes to a giant warehouse in either, there's a warehouse district in Los Angeles, and there's also one in Hollywood. And we would go to those, it would be a predetermined time and date to do this. And it's pretty much an all day event. And then I go, some people show up and it's just them. Some people show up and they have an entire band with them. Sometimes the entire group shows up as just the people. Sometimes the entire group shows up and they bring all their instruments because they think they have to play for me, and which is not the case. Uh, I walk through the area and I look for who are the demons pointing out to me. And then I walk into like a group of those people and I ask who wants to be famous. You know, when I do this, I'm dressed as the high wizard. So if anybody wants to know what that looks like, there's an artist named Pink and she has a song like a pill. If you look up her official video, there's a high wizard in her video four times. The final two times he's conducting a ritual or a spell. So I ask who wants to be famous? And everybody says they want to be famous. And then I say, what would you be willing to do to be famous? Well, most people say, well, I wouldn't do anything with children or nothing with animals. Well, then I just keep going. Because Satan doesn't want the person that draws a line in the sand. He wants the person that's willing to jump in the mud and be drugged through it. When I find that person, I give them what's called a tier two card. It's a, it's a white plain business card with a phone number on it. And I tell them to call that number. Some of them have an address on it. So, or you go to that address and you do whatever it is they ask you to do. And you'll be famous. What they have to do is sell their soul through the Illuminati. And then once you're hooked into the Illuminati, then you have to agree to do whatever it is they ask you to do. So if you're supposed to promote a certain clothing line, then that's what you're doing. You're going to dress the same for all your album covers or for all your concerts, for all your videos. Or, you know, if you're supposed to promote Barack Obama as the president, even if you're Republican, you have to promote Barack Obama as the president, you know, because that's what the Illuminati says you have to do. You know, as a result of this, you get a huge house and a lot of cars and a lot of money. But, you know, you've sold your soul. Now, having said that, it is impossible to sell what you don't own. Right. God died for you. Jesus paid the ultimate price for your soul. You don't own it. You can't loan it. You can't lease it. You certainly can't sell it. You may have heard that Satan's a liar. I'm here to confirm. You know, it, what you've done, you can give your will to the devil. All you've got to do to give your will back to God is go to confession. You, know, you might need a deliverance or, or an exorcism afterwards, but, you know, the, the, the basic is that you need confession. You know, and for all the Protestants that are listening that say, well, I go directly to God. It's like, really, how do you know he, he, he forgives you? And what do you do for your penance? I've never talked to a Protestant that says they do penance. You know, I've also never talked to one that said they knew for a fact they were forgiven. And what happens if God decides to bind that, that sin on earth? Then what happens? And they don't seem to know how to understand that verse. Right. 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 So the Illuminati is real. Now, when we see the um, celebrities, when they're taking pictures, they're covering one eye. Is that just for fun or is that legitimately Illuminati? That's identifying themselves as Illuminati. You know, that's letting the whole world know this is how I got rich. This is how I got famous. You know, so when you see Lady Gaga doing it, although Lady Gaga confirms that she did a concert, she did a show in a strip club and when she was leaving outside the back door of the strip club, this guy stopped her to talk to her about making her famous. 
and he identified himself as being in the Illuminati and told her if she sold her soul to the Illuminati, she would be rich and famous, and then that happened. You know, yeah. there's, uh, there's videos all over YouTube of different artists that talk about selling their souls. You know, Katy Perry says that her parents were evangelists and she traveled the world with them and she wanted to be the next Amy Grant, but she failed, so she sold her soul to the devil. There's also a picture of her at the uh, Satanic Temple in Salem, Massachusetts. Wow. And there's also, there's a, a video with Bob Dylan on 60 Minutes where he said he sold his soul to the devil and he's fulfilling his end of the bargain. You know, he's staying on tour. Yeah, I've heard that. And then how, how about the back masking in some of the famous songs? Is that real or not? The Stairway to Heaven, Hotel California, those things? Yeah, well, Hotel California, I don't know if there's back masking in it. I know that the song Forwards tells a story. It's, it's telling a story about the Church of Satan that was started by Anton LaVey. You know, I mean, it says, you know, we haven't had that spirit here since 1969. That's when I think they bought their church, which used to be a Christian church. So, I mean, it, it, the, entire, the entire song is about Anton LaVey, as well as in the, it was a double album set, I think. And if you opened up the album, you would see Anton LaVey's face in the upstairs part of the building. In the Hotel California album? Yeah, in the Hotel California album. Um, were, you, were you ever there at that building? No. All right. No, he, he was an atheistic Satanist, and my Satanic coven had been a theistic Satanist coven. Okay, well, I'm, I guess you kind of explained the difference there, but ha so yeah, how does that, how does that work? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> um, I know, I know uh, atheistic Satanist doesn't seem to make sense. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the Satanic temple, they're atheistic Satanists. They believe that Satanism is the worst thing you could be called, and they're all about hedonism and doing whatever feels good. Now, I got interviewed by the Terry and Jesse show probably close to 15 times, and one of on one of their shows i said that you know I, I got interviewed when the satanic temple was doing something they were doing something with the baphomet statue and and i said that and they, they were doing a black mass i think in uh, oklahoma city and i said they're um they said that they wanted to be called satanists because it's the worst thing they could be called but i would think that pedophile would be the best the worst thing you could be called right so you know it's like why don't they embrace that title i don't yeah. see any statements running out yelling i was a pedophile right. it's like, no one's doing that with joy or glee right uh you know so it's like that seems like that's a much worse title than satanist and then we looked into it, it's the leader of one of the satanic temples He's a convicted pedophile. And it's like, why don't you embrace that? It sounds much worse than Satanists. Right. Uh, and he really was a pedophile, but he's not, he's still not embracing it. He's right. still claiming to be a Satanist. Like that's a step up somehow. Right. Right. And now the theistic um, Satanist, do they acknowledge? So I guess if they're involved in the occult, they could see, I, I suppose, that. Catholic things, the Catholic mass, the sacramentals and everything have a real power against them. And I remember hearing that the black mass is actually the, the, the Holy Catholic mass in reverse. And there's something, that, something to do with sacrifice there and everything backwards. Can you elaborate on that? The, the black mass, I've, I've only been to two. Um, the, the altar was actually a nude prostitute and laying on a couch basically laying on a chase and then they, they did have the, the first one i went to 
they had a Eucharist, but they didn't call it a Eucharist. And they brought it out. And this is at the end. I mean, they did um, Hail Marys backwards. Every time they invoked the devil's name or the name of Satan, they would bang a gong. Although at the second one I was at, they rang a bell. And they did the Our Father backwards. And there was a guy that was leading all this. And it, it was sort of done like theater. You had all the participants in the mass were up near the front in pews. And then you had a stage where the prostitute and the head priest was that were leading the black mass. And then a guy standing next to the gong. And then you had the regular audience that was watching the black mass and what everybody was doing. And they all had, at times they were standing, sometimes they were kneeling, and sometimes they were sitting. And then they would cross themselves with an upside down cross. And when they pulled out this Eucharist, I asked, I had my handler was there with me. I said, what's that? And he said, uh, some churches believe that's God. And I, I said, oh yeah, the Baptist church, we did it four times a year, every three months, we have a remembrance ceremony. And if you're a Christian, you're allowed to participate in it. It's like a little gross wafer yeah. and tastes terrible and a thimble of uh, grape juice. And, but I couldn't believe why anyone would think this, it looked like a vanilla wafer. Why would you think that's God? Like who could possibly think that? And then some guy flipped it off. One guy threw it around, threw it across the room. This guy stomped it. Somebody else did like a, a at that time, Dusty Rhodes was the, you know, the big deal in wrestling. So he did a Dusty Rhodes elbow down on it. And then uh, a woman hiked up her, her robe and sexually assaulted it. And then in the end, they threw it in a fire. And this was and a consecrated host. The consecrated host, but I didn't know that. I didn't know what a consecrated host was. Right. You know, I didn't have any idea. What, why are you treating a vanilla wafer like that? And then at the second one I was at, I didn't have anybody to explain it to me. So I was even more confused than the first time. None of it made sense to me, really, until 2008, in January, when I was at a Catholic church. And, you know, it, it's after my conversion. My conversion happened the day before. And then I started going to Mass the next day. And I'm sitting in there and I'm watching everything they're doing, mesmerized by like, wow, now the Black Mass makes sense. You know, now, now I'm looking at the altar and the, the, the monstrance and the temple and... You know, they, they ring a bell when, when they consecrate. And, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, now it make now that that was a mockery of this. Right. You know, it didn't make any sense to me because to me, I associated like a few years ago, I asked my dad if he knew what a black mass was because he'd heard it on the news. And he said, well, I would imagine that it's, the satanic version of a church service. So, yeah, that, that's true. That, that's correct. That is what it is. Except the only reference my dad had was the Baptist church. He's never been to a, a Catholic mass. And that was true for me. When I saw the black mass, I was thinking that they were mocking my Baptist church service, which was nothing like this. You know, it's like, there was nothing even close. You know, the only thing close was that we sat in pews, you know? So it, it didn't make any sense to me. Like, why would you do these things? You know, it, if I'd have been Catholic, I would have known, oh, that's what you're mocking. Right, and it would make sense that the devil, who's the father of lies, is gonna mock the truth. Not a knockoff, but the truth. How frequently are these black masses going on? I'm sure still now. Uh, what was it like back, you know, um, during your time during this? Was there was this going on all over the country, all over the world, every week, every day? It goes on um, 
every night at midnight, which is the witching hour, there's an extended black mass that I, I've never sat in on one. I don't know how they extend it. I don't know what they do. Um, but it extends till 3 a.m., which is the devil's hour. And that's when it culminates. And I, supposedly they have um, a stolen Eucharist to all of these. And you know, this is for, they consecrate all the uh, aborted babies during the night all that happened during that 24 hour period. They some, consecrate them all to the devil at that time. And that happens in every time zone across the world. So all aborted fetuses, that they're, they're saying certain spells or whatever words to consecrate those aborted fetuses? Yes. Oh, wow. Wow. So, okay. <laughs> wow, yes, that's, that's something. So now there really is something to that 3 o'clock hour because the hour of the Divine Mercy, 3 o'clock, 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, 3 p.m., um, 3 p.m., 3 a.m. would be the, yeah, the opposite, the inverse. Oh, right. Wow, that's something. And how did you did they ever say how they stole the Eucharists? Um, Were in, there certain parishes they would target? Was it receiving in the hand versus on the tongue? Uh, ways of anything if, like that? If you receive on the tongue, you know, I demonstrated this at a talk I did in New Jersey uh, a few years ago. And the, the priest there was, was a priest named Father Fryer. He was uh, an FSSP pre pre priest. And I, I said that if somebody asked me a question during my talk, you know, during the q and I need a host that I can make a demonstration with, but I need an unconsecrated one. Sure. So he brought out an unconsecrated host for me. And somebody asked me, what I thought about receiving in the hand versus on the tongue. And I said, well, here's why they can't be stolen if they're put on the tongue. And I put one in my mouth and I left it there for a little bit and then I pulled it out. And you can tell it's been used. It's been on the tongue. It, it doesn't look fresh anymore. Right. And you can't sell that. You know, once it's been on the tongue, it's no good to a Satanist. They don't want that. And then I showed how. And I said, now, I'm not good at this. It's called palming. Right. But I put my hand out and put my hand underneath it. And I had Father Fire put the Eucharist in my hand. And then I put one finger over it. And I acted like I put it in my mouth. And I chewed it up. And I said, where's the Eucharist? And everybody in the room said, you put it in your mouth and chewed it and swallowed it. And then I reached into my pocket and I pulled it out. Wow. And is this what I chewed up and swallowed? And they're like, you already had one in your pocket. And Father Fryer was like, no, he didn't. This is the same Eucharist I gave him. Wow. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's important. That's, that's important to know. That's why, you know, the, on the tongue is the, is the best way to do it. In my mind, the only way to do it. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, there's also, like, if you've ever been to the Eastern Church, you know, when like the Ukrainian Byzantine, when they do it, now I'm not going to get these terms right because I'm not, you know, that, that type of Catholicism, but they have like a chalice that has the Eucharist with the wine mixed together and they dip a spoon in it and then dip it into your mouth that way. And, and the, the Eucharist looks like a crouton. Right. And, um, you know, there'd be no way to to take that and give it and sell it to the Satanists. And the people that sell it to the Satanists on the cheap side is generally about $1,500. And if they're desperate, they'll pay as much as $15,000. They wow. say the average is about $5,000 a Eucharist. Although last year there was a scandal on Etsy where a guy was selling Eucharist for you had to buy 11 of them and they were $99. So $9 each. And I think I have that price, right? And he claimed he was a Catholic priest and consecrating hosts for Satanists. 
Wow. I don't know how true any of that was, but apparently a group of Catholics got all their pool, their money together and bought all the Eucharist that he sold and then gave them to a, a priest so that he could, you know, do, you know, whatever he did with them. You know, he took care of all of them. Wow. Can, can Satanists tell if it's a real, a consecrated host versus an unconsecrated host? Some can. So, and they say that the way that they can tell is that they either feel extreme hatred towards the consecrated one or they feel sickness from it. Okay. You know, it seems like if that were the case, because most of the people that do black masses are atheistic Satanists. It seems like if they could tell which one was consecrated, that that would make them believe in God. Yeah, you, yeah, you would think. <laughs> now, were there, were there ever times that you could remember that any magic or anything you or the, or the people in your coven were, you felt like your spells or anything were thwarted by sacramentals or Catholic prayer or holy things? We did... Um, when we would be doing a hex, which for our coven, a hex involved uh, an abortion, we would have um, different Satanists have different jobs. And we would have a group of Satanists that would be praying to the devil to keep Christians at bay, away from us, you know, to keep them so they're not influencing our decisions or not stopping what we're doing. Because we were told at times that Christians do that, you know, and, and it's like, why? Why would they do that? And it's like they don't know specifically who we are, but they know that nefarious things happen on a regular basis. So they would be praying regularly to stop the Satanists from whatever they're doing. And I'd talked to other Satanists that said, that they've had things that just failed. You know, spells that they were trying to do or rituals they were trying to do were stuff just, you know, no matter what they did, it wouldn't work. And then they would find out that the church across the street from them or up the road from them was praying specifically to thwart them. Wow. Yeah, the power of prayer shows how it it, it is it is real and it's having an an actual impact, whether or not people realize it or not. Like you said, a lot of people don't even realize they're in the middle of a massive spiritual war. And it's a, uh, it's kind of scary in some ways because, you know, when you realize that spiritual warfare is a real thing and that the power of your prayer can stop the devil, it makes you realize though, that the devil really is out there. Right. Right. And you mentioned that abortions were involved in your hexes. How did, how did that come about? What was that about? The first one I did, I was um, about 14 years old. And I was told that we were going to have a sex party that involved all the males between 12 and 15 and a female that was over the age of 18. And the reason was to make her pregnant. And then we were going to have an abortion in eight or nine months. And when I first heard that, I said, cool. And then I went home to look up what an abortion was because I didn't have any idea. And then, you know, I couldn't find anything. My dictionary didn't have the word abortion in it. So I had to go back to my coven and say, hey, I heard I was going to be involved in an abortion, but I don't know what that is. And the guy said, well, you're, you're killing a baby in the womb. And I was like, is that legal? He goes, oh yeah, in the womb legal, out of the womb murder. So nine months later, practically, we were doing an abortion. That one, the first one was at a farmhouse. And that farmhouse was more sterile than any abortion clinic I've ever been in. You know, it was full equipment, it was an abortion doctor and a nurse there. And my job was to get blood on my hands. It could be the woman's blood or the baby's blood. It didn't matter which. I have to get blood on my hands to do the ritual. But the abortions that I did in clinics were done similarly. Somebody at the abortion clinic is a Satanist. 
and they get permission from the person that's going in to get the abortion, a lot of times we use breeders. These are women that intentionally get pregnant so they can have an abortion. And, you know, they know full well why they're there. They're, they're voluntarily get, getting an abortion. And many times they know they're there because a Satanist group is going to come in. And usually those abortions happen after hours. But sometimes you can't. You can't do it after hours. Either the woman can't do it or sometimes you can't do it after hours. You have to be there during the day. So you have to make sure that the right people are working on that day where somebody's not going to see the high wizard walk in and go, what the, you know, what is that? You know, what that ritual happening? You know, so everybody's got to think that it's normal and you walk in and you do the abortion and you leave. And, um, you know, I've had three abortions like that that failed. You know, they, they happened during the day and I couldn't figure out what went wrong. And, you know, when I went back to the office, I asked, okay, so pull all the files of all the failed abortions and I want to read them all. And I read everybody's and all of them said stuff about Jesus ropes, prayer beads. Um, nobody said rosary. You know, it really wasn't until I was Catholic and I was out in front of an abortion clinic praying a rosary with everybody else that I realized this is what stopped the abortion from working. You know, it was praying the rosary because if, if everybody would have said rosary in their reports, then I'd have just known, okay, we can't do this during the day because Christians can be out in front praying these rosaries and stopping us from, from, you know, completing our abortions. You know, wow. we had over 21 failed abortions because all of those happened during the day and people were out front praying rosaries. So it would just fail. It, you wouldn't be able to do it. Right. You know, so, you know, I, I told people on, on my, my, um, you know, our thing with Karen on Wednesday, yeah. that on Odom, which a lot of people think is pronounced Autumn, it's A-U-T-O-M, it's a Catholic company that sells wholesale, they'll sell you 100 rosaries for 39 cents each. So, I mean, $39, if you've got $39 plus shipping burning a hole in your pocket, go buy 100 rosaries and hand them out to everybody like candy at the abortion clinic. Right. Right. Print out, print out that there's a, a prayer you can get that pray, shows you how to pray the rosary. And the way it prints out, there's like six of them on a sheet of paper. So print out enough to get a hundred of them, you know, cut them out and staple them to the, the rosary packs. They come in a little plastic bag and then hand them out as gifts when you're, you know, there's got to be Catholics there that don't have a rosary. Right wouldn't bring one with them, or Protestants that might have read that verse in the Bible that says nothing you do for God is wasted. So, I mean, if you're praying the rosary, then, you know, even if they don't believe in Mary, I don't know, she's mentioned in the Bible why you wouldn't believe in her, and if she's got any power, then agree that, you know, you're praying it to God. Right. Right. Now, it's such an immensely powerful prayer Every time the Blessed Mother appears, it seems like she says to pray the rosary, so we should be doing that. And now, did everyone in your coven have to have blood on their hands? Is, was that a requirement? Just, just the high wizard. All right. Were there any requirements of, of, of the other people? Did they have to participate in any other kind of behaviors? Anything like that? Any other sins? Well, in the first coven I was in, it took 13 steps to be a Satanist. So if you're a child, there's 13 different steps. If you're an adult, there's 13 steps. I joined when I was 12. I officially became a member when I was 13. Um, it was like you had to lie to your parents. You had to steal something. You had to, um, I don't know, the final steps, I had to slice my thumb and bleed onto a document and sign it in three places in my own blood. The blood of Jesus washes away all sin, but not mine. 
Jesus died for everybody, but not me. And on the final page of the five page document, I agreed to sell my soul to the devil. You know, like I said before, it's impossible to sell what you don't own. Right. Uh, you know, in regular Satanism, you, you're not really required to do these things. But if you're not sinning, we kind of look at you with suspicion. You know, if you're, if you're going to drink, you need to drink in excess. If you're going to take drugs, you need to take a lot. You know, if you're going to have sex, you, you need to have a girlfriend. You need to have a lot. You know, or, you know, if you've ever wanted to act on your homosexuality, please do. You know, it's like whatever you think is a sin isn't. You know, it's like, yeah, this, this person named God is saying don't do it. So you should extra go out and do it. And it's pretty much how they felt. You know, the, the more sinning you were doing, the better guy you were. So it was th like that kind of peer pressure. They wanted to see that you weren't just professing to be part of the coven, but you were, actu you were actively involved in indulging your desires. Right. Wow. And now did all those people wind up, or most of them have dealings directly with demons? Did demons speak to them? Did they interact with them? Or that really wasn't par for the course? Um, for the regular person, the regular Satanists in there, I'm not really sure. Because I never considered myself just a regular Satanist. I was almost always, in my first coven, we wore white robes were for the brand new initiates. Black robes was what everybody else wore. And the red robe was worn by the magic practitioner. And that's what I wanted. I thought the red robe looked the coolest. When I got to my second coven, and I, I saw the, the high wizard for the second time, I saw him the first time when I was 13 at a sleepover, and I didn't know what it was. And then I saw him again, a different guy with the same look at, at this coven meeting. And I grabbed somebody, and I was like, who is that? What is that? How can I do that? And they said it was the high wizard and they didn't know how I did it. They said that they believe that Satan handpicks the high wizard. So I had to get Satan's attention. So I figured doing abortions would get Satan's attention. So I kept doing that with this coven. And then when I became the high wizard, you know, I got, I became the high wizard when I was 21 and, um, I would regularly see demons or see demonic activity. You know, I've seen demons do things. Uh, at some point, I thought it was me that was able to do things. But I realized over time that when I did something, it was a demon doing it. You know, even when you put a curse on somebody, you know, for the person that thinks, oh, my magic is so strong that I'm able to curse this person. It's like, no, you're not. You're not strong. You don't have anything. You know, when you, when you put a curse on somebody, you're praying to the devil to attach a demon to somebody. That's all you're doing. If the curse works, the person was not in a state of grace and the demon was able to attach. If the curse failed, the person's in a state of grace most likely and the demon couldn't attach to him. And were you able to see this happening? Like the, yeah. the, the, the yeah. demon, you just tell, go ahead. Usually the person that I put a curse on is not anywhere close to me. And I'm not seeing them when I do it. You know, there's a curse called the line of sight curse. And in that one, that's usually like a very basic witch, somebody that's new to the game. They have to be watching the person as they put the curse on them. And they have to stay with them the whole time. If the person's in a state of grace, it doesn't stick. But also, it's the only curse that if they get the curse and they go to confession, that breaks the curse. Right. And just showing the importance of the sacraments, the monumental importance of the sacraments there. Absolutely. Are there any um, the more shocking things about Satanism that you think Catholics need to know that maybe they've never heard before? Oh, well, even the, the theistic Satanists, 
they believe in God, but they don't really believe in the story in the Bible. You know, when you're in the low levels of Satanism, you kind of believe, you know, you're taught that in the end, there's going to be an epic battle and Satan will win. You know, and then as you move further up into the ranks of Satanism, you find out that your, your God is a liar and that most likely in the end, you're just going to die and go to hell. You know, but you're given so much of what you ask for. It's hard to just turn your back on that. You know, you, you don't get the, when you sign the deal and you sign up for your millions of dollars and your big house and your 12 cars, you might end up with three cars and not quite a mansion and a hundred thousand dollars. But to some people, that's what they want. You know, they wanted to be famous and some people just get a one night, you know, one hit wonder and they're happy with that. You know, some people want the lifetime of rock and roll. Right. So it's, so it's hard for them to turn their back on it right. once it's happened. Right. You know, once you're, once you're in that, it's hard to say no to it. You know, and always hold it over your head. Well, you know, if you leave, you might be suicided out, which basically means murdered, you know, and you'll go to hell. You might as well live as long as you can and enjoy it while you got it. You know, no one tells them that all you got to do is go to confession and give your will back to God. And it's all over for you. You know, yeah, I mean, you might need a deliverance or an exorcism, but at least you wouldn't be hooked in with the devil anymore. Right. But they're, but they're afraid that, because would, would they go in saying, well, I'll make my millions or I'll get famous and then I'll just turn back to God, or that's not really how they approach it. Well, even when I was a kid, when I sold my soul, I always thought, well, I'm not going to die till I'm 95. So I've got plenty of time to turn back. The, the, the downside to that is that we don't know when we're going to die. Right. You know, and you hear about plenty of kids dying. You know, any of those kids could have sold their soul and they're burning in hell right now because they thought they had another 80 years to go. And right. they. Right. Yeah. And how do they, how do they recruit kids and adults into a life of Satanism? In my first coven, uh, like I said, I used to play campaigns of D and D every weekend. Right. And we had a kid that used to play with us and then he just stopped going and he stopped. We stopped seeing him at school. And we figured he moved away, but it turned out he was homeschooled and he came back to our D and D circle and said that he plays with another group that thinks magic works. It's real. And they play in D and D every weekend. So I wanted to go check these guys out because I knew, I knew magic worked. I knew it was real. And when I went over there, it's like kids and adults hanging out together at this place. And, you know, I love playing pinball and playing pool. And they had a pool table there. And they had uh, a couple of pinball machines and real video games. You know, and I'm like, oh, this is a cool place. And then, you know, it was time for lunch. And they said, you know, you can have a pizza or a burger. You know, I was like, pizza? And so... You know, we had pizza for lunch, and then later we had chips for snacks. Yeah. So it seemed like a pretty good setup. Hello? Hello? Are we still on here? <laughs> 